Morning, glory, America. Bonjour, high Canada. Hugh Hewitt on this Monday, August 22nd, the year of our Lord, 2022. Good to have you back again on what is officially the last week of summer. That's because I declared it so. It is the last week of summer. So I'm playing a little 1967 music for you. That's going to be our bumps today. And I settled on this after fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I took Genghis Kate to our favorite takeout yesterday afternoon. The other grands have been scattered among uncles and parents around coastal Maine. And uh, she scared the dogs, of course. But the we had a lovely chat with a, a good Mainer couple. I mean, you know a real Mainer couple when they've spent 60-plus winters in Maine. We're pretend Mainers. Uh, and... We had, we had a lovely time, but the line was immense. I mean, it was just immense. Everyone getting their, their last lobster roll of the summer. Because, look, it used to be that Labor Day marked the end of summer and the beginning of election season in the fall and the return to school. Now summer officially begins with the kickoff of the first major college football game, which this year actually occurs in Dublin on Saturday between Northwestern's Wildcats, Wildcats and... Nebraska's Cornhuskers, and it's they, they're all confused in Nebraska and, and Chicago, home of the Wildcats, because at, at Nebraska and Northwestern, they thought the capital of Ireland was South Bend, and so they're very confused about this game. But in any event, I know some students are back in school, and others will go back this week, and most will go back next week, and then there are some traditional stragglers who will show up on, on Tuesday uh, September the 6th, and they'll say, we're here, and they've missed two weeks of school. But that, but this is really it. This is the last full week, and there's a bit of desperation about people in the last full week of summer. They go out on the water as much as they can. They begin to look around the lake to figure out, you know, where all the clothes have found, where are the towels, and how in the world did the swim trunks end up in the attic, and all the other stuff that goes with summer. They put the canoe away. They They don't bother to buy another can a bug off. And they are, they're just ready. They're getting in that mind. And for the election season ahead, that's really where we begin to turn our attention as the Republicans prepare to slay many Democrats at the polls. There was some news, but I, I do want to tell you the last summer of genuine innocence, at least for me, and I think for the country was 1966. Uh, because in 1966, only, and I say that in quotations, Mark, only 6,350 Americans died in Vietnam. In 1967, it began to dawn on people. I believe that's the year the AP began to do a daily casualty count from Vietnam, and 11,363 Americans died in Vietnam in 1967. That was the famed summer of love in San Francisco. And time It was hippies and Jesus people and Lots of music like Keith singing 98.6, One Hit Wonders dominated the top 40, and popular culture began to explode. 1968, it all comes unglued. That's the year of the most dead in Vietnam, 16,899. Did you know in 1969, Nixon's president drops from 16,899 to 11,780 Americans died? And each one of them a tragedy and felt across America. But, but at that point, there are riots in urban centers. There were riots against the war. There have been two assassinations in 1968. 1969, it drops to 11,000. Nixon, 1970, first full year as president, 6,173 deaths. 1971, 2,414. But by that point, they were like deaths in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. America was aware of every one of them. In 1972, 759, 1973, 68 died, 1974, one died. Now, the, uh, the collapse of Vietnam caused 62 American deaths in 1975, the Republic of Vietnam. But, but if you go back to that 1968 number of 16,899, that's the peak of the war in terms of carnage in America. The summer before that is the beginning of the youth movement and the hippie movement, and it's the last summer of sort of innocence. It's the summer of love, and it's a great summer. And so I'll just play the, that music. But I know that you are out there saying, oh, I don't want to listen to the news. I don't want to go back to work. I don't want to get into the routine. The market swings will be wild this week because half the traders will start showing up and they'll still have on their Bahama shorts 
and half of America has to go back to work in the office this year. COVID is over. Look, COVID is so over. COVID is over, over, over. And the CD3 threw in the towel on Friday with their, here's our report on how we screwed up. And we've moved on to, to the monkeypox. And by the way, there will be an annual shot for COVID. And I'll get it. Like I got the, the vaccines and I got the boosters. I'm not worried about, you know, my MNRNA, whatever it is, being altered. That's all hoo-ha. It worked. Thank you, President Trump and Operation Warp Speed. Uh, the elections will get underway. And it will be about six things. Okay, I want you to remember these six things, three A's and three E's. Affordability, because we can't. We don't afford anything. God bless the parents who have to put three, four, five, six kids into schools this, this fall, and they all want something new to wear, and they all want notebooks and pens. I don't know what you're going to do. Anxiety, and not just over inflation, but this is really where crime comes in, right? This is really where crime worries you. You watch the news and you see it. So you've got affordability and anxiety, and then anger. Anger over silly things dominating the news. And they are not silly to the individuals who are involved in them, but issues of transgenderism and ESG, uh, they are sitting there for the picking by Republicans because they just drive normal, ordinary Americans crazy. And the stigmatization of the ordinary is what has got people angered in the United States. And I, I will expand on this as we go along. Then the three E's, all right? Energy. Gasoline prices are down 40 cents, 50 cents, even 60 cents a gallon because it's the end of summer, the end of driving season and re recession is here. And people are just, and inflation cuts into your budget and you just don't make two trips to the grocery store. You make one. Uh, energy. And people are, are also worried about, of course, uh, education. And education is going to be number one on many people's greatest hit list because it's simply the all-encompassing problem in America is that education has turned from an engine of opportunity into ideological brainwashing in many public schools and parents have had it. And then finally under ESG, the Economic Social Governance Movement, um, Environment Social Government governance issue. The ESG is shorthand for we want to run your corporations to benefit the left-wing ideology of small groups of activists and not the bottom line of profit for shareholders, and we're not putting up with it anymore. And ESG is, is amplified by the fact that there are only two proxy advisory firms in the world. And you say, what in the world is a proxy advisory firm? Well, that's the root of all evil. There are only two of them that do about 95, 97% of the business of advising companies and uh, or shareholders, massive shareholders, how to vote their company share. So, you know, all these big portfolio companies out there on Wall Street or the big pension funds in California, they get to vote in every proxy. They get millions of votes in proxy statements on Amazon and, and Google and Chevron and Exxon. And they are voting these crazy left-wing ideologies. You know, they're demanding green energy for Exxon. <laughs> which is, you know, about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We're going to be a green energy company and we produce oil. And by the way, we're not going out of the oil business for a long, long time. Take a look at Europe. They're already beginning to lay in blankets because they don't have any natural gas because Russia cut them off. They've closed most of their nuclear power plants in Germany. Olaf Scholz, their chancellor, is down at 20. He's worse than Biden in terms of approval ratings. So let me run through just a few headlines. Deadly siege of Somali Hotel. Did you even know? that uh, 21 civilians were killed by a 30-hour terrorist attack in Mogadishu, and you think to yourself, doesn't that happen every weekend? No, Mogadishu had a semblance of normalcy, but El Shabib is back. Uh, you may have seen about the car explosion killing the daughter of Putin's brain, as they call him. Um, she got blown up, and immediately, the and, and her father watched. It's a horrific story, and I actually feel for the father, although Alexander Dugan is a nut. Uh, uh, Russia immediately began to blame Ukraine. Uh, she, Daria Dugina, was a Russian hawk who railed against the Western global hegemony, according to the New York Times. And Russia blames Kiev for the killing of daughter of Putin's Rasputin, according to the Telegraph. And the New York Times also says the brazen attack has rattled Russians. Really? You know what's rattling Russians? They had another drone strike at the Russian Navy headquarter in Crimea. The Ukrainian partisans are out there. We need to feed Ukraine. Go to Help Ukraine banner at the top of HughHewitt.com, please. Help Ukraine 
is where you go. It's a blue and yellow thing. Every dollar is four meals. Please go there. This is the last week of summer. Give of what you did not spend this summer to feed Ukraine this winter. Stay tuned. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by... Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. My penultimate book of the summer is this little book, The Virtues, by my next guest, John Garvey. And John, this is a little bit weird. I feel like I should know you because we grew up 10 miles apart. Your aunt and uncle lived next door to my parents when I was born, and they were their fast friends forever. Your cousin, Keelan, is one of my closest friends in the world. I think you left Harvard's campus three months before I set foot on it. Bob Rosenfeld may have been on your law review. You've been in legal academic circles forever, and I would go to the AALS, but I never met you there. And then you've lived in D.C. since I've been there. I mean, how long were you at President of Catholic University, John? Uh, for 12 years. And uh, what's more, you left Michigan right before I went to teach at the law school there. And we were both in the Reagan administration, although you were a much more important person than I was. Oh, that's not true. I was down the hall. The smart people were at OLC with Ted Olson. And I was running around with uh, with the attorney general doing the classified stuff. But it was it was workmanlike. It didn't require deep thinking. John, I uh, and so I'm glad to make your acquaintance finally. Uh, a Sharon kid turned out well. I'm pretty amazed by that, given that you have to be a Steelers fan. I'm not. Are you a Browns fan or a Steelers fan, John Gardner? I'm. I'm embarrassed to say I'm a Patriots fan. Oh man, that could end it right now because of Bill Belichick. But I'll. I'll digress. I love your book, and I want to begin with the virtues by telling people what I told people online. It's the perfect group for small groups of all sorts, men's groups, women's groups, youth groups, couples groups. Did you have that in mind, John Garvey? Because that's a very Protestant thing as opposed to a Catholic thing. No, I didn't actually have that in mind. I, I uh, The book grew out of a bunch of uh, talks that I gave at commencements every year for, gosh, nearly 25 years. And in the last uh, half dozen years, I've taught a class called The Virtues to freshmen in the honors program at Catholic. That's what it grew out of. What? What a great, let me begin with the, the four things that I know the most about. No, the, number one, the most memorable line and the takeaway, if people don't read the virtues, I want them to remember this from page 152, repentance is the duct tape of family life. I've already used that two or three times because it's so true, John. Explain that. Well, uh, the thing you, you have to learn when you're uh, when you get married is to say, I'm sorry and mean it. So... Uh, that's that helps people make up and uh, bring families back together. So, yeah, it's a it, you learn a lot of virtues when you get married. We've noticed this with our own children. You know, when kids go through uh, when kids are growing up, when they get to be 14, 16, 18, they're going through their teens. Um, there's so much that's changing in their lives. They're they're focused on themselves and rightly so. But man, they're selfish. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. The first step away from selfishness that we've noticed with our own children is when they fall in love with somebody and they've got to begin worrying about someone else. And then when they have children, uh, they have a whole new set of concerns. So uh, getting getting married is a, is a good school of virtue. It is. And the second line, which I used again this weekend, is I am uh, blessed with five grandchildren, the middle one of whom is called Genghis Kate. Uh, and your page went to mercy is a grandparent's virtue. Absolutely correct. Can't be a parent's virtue all the time, but it's always a grandparent's virtue, John Garvey. Why don't you expand on that? We had this, uh, this experience in our house uh, at different, uh, we have five children, and at one time or another, four of them have lived with us as married adults with children, e either because somebody has crashed and burned or because their lives have moved them to a new city where they needed a different place to live. And we found that um, in the case of uh, our fourth child, he and his wife uh, lived with us through the last part of college and all of law school and a year in between. So their children grew up in our house. They would get in our bed. You know, we, they, by, they had three by the time they left. Um, we found that we couldn't treat them the way the, the rule in our house when our kids were growing up was that uh, there's the, the rules are the rules and grandparents can do whatever they want. But if you're living That's... together with if you're living together with the parents and you do whatever you want, then you're busting the parents' rules and the kids uh, don't understand the distinction. So uh, mercy is something that grandparents can show, but not if they're taking care of, not if the children are living with them. Yeah, because my daughter is a military spouse, we've had her in the house with her children for extended months. And you're absolutely right. Mercy is a grandparent's virtue. Now, I always say in a book, there's a memorable anecdote, something I haven't found before. The story you tell that I had not read before 
was about Dorothy Day on the bus. And that's from on page 52. Would you explain that to people or, or describe it to people? Because it's quite striking. Well, um, we find this to be true. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do with our own children uh, in bringing them up is to uh, have them come and work at soup kitchens or, uh, you know, get acquainted with people whose lives are not as fortunate as their own. You know, they had the good fortune to have a dad and a mom who had jobs and could uh, put food on the table every day. Um, and uh, one of the things that Dorothy Day says about the poor, and she lived with them and knew better than any of us, uh, is they're not necessarily grateful and they can smell. I, I, so don't don't expect to be doing this for their thanks. That's not uh, that's not what charity is about. Well, I, I'm recalling when she's on a bus uh, surrounded by poor people and she just spontaneously begins to cry, which is, as you put it, and a, a moment of love, a moment of charity, because she just feels for these people in a way that a lot of Americans confronted with omnipresence of homelessness are taking out of their emotional repertoire, John. I think that's actually vanishing because of the immensity of the, the population. You know, it's not just the immensity of the population. It's the fact that since the 1930s, we've outsourced our generosity to the government, and we're we don't consider it part of our own responsibilities to take care of people who aren't as fortunate as we are. Now, there is a line as well. I want you to explain something to me. I always try and read seriously, but not literally, because I, I, if I read literally, I'd be confounded. You say, when you were 16th, you went to nerd camp, math, math camp. Quote, it was the first time I'd ever met anybody who was smart. Now, I know Keelan. So I know really brilliant people in your family. I think you meant it's the first time you met one of those geniuses in math, right? Well, it was a little more than that. Keelan didn't live in Sharon, so there wasn't a whole lot ah. of competition for the smartest kid in Sharon. But uh, I went to I went to study calculus and analytic geometry at Cornell, and there were all these kids from New York City, and they all had like five eight hundreds on their SATs. And the kid in the in the room next to me um, hadn't taken trigonometry, and he was doing calculus, so he bought a trig book and read it <laughs> over a couple of days. And yeah, those are really smart people, and and. Uh, I was not that smart, um, so I had, it was a step in my growing up, I, I felt really insecure, and so I started smoking cigarettes, a habit which I didn't give up for another 30 years. I didn't give it up till I was 40. Uh, you bring up one of my favorite virtues, one of the little virtues, and I'll go through the, the index here in a second. One of the little virtues is studiousness. Now, my first year of law school was spent underground at Michigan, and you know that wonderful library you taught there. And I, you just get a carol and you put your butt there. Nixon called it the iron buttedness of the first year of law school. I think it applies to medical school and business school as well. But if you're not studious, you don't survive. And studiousness is, as you call it, a young virtue. Uh, can you illustrate that other way? Studiousness is so important and we're losing it, I think. It doesn't seem like a virtue either, does it? But it's one of the things no. that we're losing in the culture that we have of... Um, uh, cell phones and uh, digest, pre-digested news for and USA Today, people don't read more than two paragraphs on any particular subject, and they don't concentrate and have that iron buttedness that you referred to, keep their focus on one particular topic. It, it's, it's important, and it carries over not just from your homework, but to your prayer life. Uh, that's true. It's also not something that can be dispensed with when you don't care for what you're reading. I hated contracts. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Love crimes, love constitutional law. Contracts, hated it. Didn't mean, Hated the rule against perpetuities. You still have to know it. That's where studiousness kicks in. Let me read the index, John Garvey, so people will know what I'm talking about. The virtues are divided into theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. The cardinal virtues, which are also fairly familiar, prudence, justice, courage, and temperance, but then the little virtues, which become a little bit less well-known, more exotic, the virtues of youth are humility, honesty, docility, silence, modesty, studiousness, industriousness, of middle age, and this is fascinating, truthfulness, patience, generosity, meekness, which I'm going to come back to, constancy and hospitality, and of old age, and we're both in it now, repentance, gratitude, mercy, magnanimity, which is a difficult one, gentleness, and not merely to say gentleness, benignity, and then the crown of virtues, which are not virtues, but the products, wisdom, peace, and joy. Can I start with docility? Because a lot of people will recoil, particularly in the age in which we live, which is combative, from the idea of being docile when in fact it's a virtue. Yeah, 
there are some of these uh, docility as an example, um, uh, mercy, which you uh, mentioned already, and studiousness that don't strike people uh, offhand as as virtuous. But um, I think it's one of the most necessary uh, in our time. Uh, I find as I get older and see how our children are being as parents, we just sent our first grandchild off to college. Um, I find that there are different ways of doing things. You know, we were inclined to be critical of how uh, our kids were raising their children, but we found that they can turn out well in a variety of different ways. Um, when I was 40, I was a lot more certain about how things ought to, ought to run than I am now. Um, uh, so docility is paired in a way with humility. You, you, you learn not to, not to jump in with your own conclusions and to express your own views. Um, just be quiet for a minute and listen to what other people have to say and uh, take it all on board. You may learn something even when you're 50, 60, 70 years old. Yeah, the best advice I got as a parent very early on was from a guy named Peter Buffa, who's still out in California, wonderful man, who said, you have no idea what your children are going to end up doing or where they're going to end up living. Don't try and figure it out for them. And he's absolutely right. Correct? I mean, just in, in my experience, no idea what they would end up doing, being, and where they would be. And it's worked out well, but you can't predict it. No, you can't predict it, and, and you can't steer them one way or another. The best thing you can do is just uh, – our, our advice to our children when they are growing up was – uh, I, I don't care what you do um, as an adult. I don't care what you study in college. I want you to do something that you love, that you have a passion for, and do that. And things will turn out right if you work hard at it. So, so far, it's working. Before our break, John Garvey, I want to talk about silence, uh, specifically because you talk about Twitter in the context of talking about silence. The ability to hold back our thumbs, tweet not, but that it may benefit others. There's a lot of flexibility there, but it is certainly an admonition to not tweet in haste. There's, uh, oh boy, isn't that the truth? What, uh, as president, uh, and before that as dean, I would always counsel my uh, my faculty as president, my vice presidents, and the people who reported to me uh, that if they had something really important to say to someone, sit down and say it face to face. And the next best was to do it on the telephone so that you could hear reactions. Uh, the third best was to write it out by hand, but don't put anything on Twitter or email that you don't want to see in the Washington Post, because often as not, that's where it'll end up. Now, John, I hope you'll consider writing an essay on what makes a great college president. I've worked with three of them. Mark Guerin is my closest friend in the world. He's back at Hobart and William Smith College. Uh, Daniele Strupa, and before him, Jim Doty at Chapman, great college. It's an impossible job. I really, I don't know how you do it. You wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that job on my worst enemy, but you seem to have enjoyed it, embraced it. We'll come back. Am I right about that? It's the best job I ever had. I, I loved every day of it. Be glad well, Mark would say that. Mark said that until it was the worst job he ever had because bad things happen on college campuses, right? And you have to break it's terrible sure. news to parents sometimes. Yeah, you got to give terrible news to parents. We were pretty fortunate in that respect. That didn't happen all that often. The last few years uh, with the COVID shutdown have been really difficult for students, uh, and they were enormously expensive for universities. The first of those years, uh, we took a $45 million bite out of our operating budget. Wow. wow. I'm COVID. coming right back with John Garvey. During the break, go get the virtues at Amazon. It really is just the perfect coda to a summer well spent. I'll be right back with John Garvey on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Conversation with John Garvey, recent past president of Catholic University, the author of this book, The Virtues, which I would encourage all of you to go out and get because it will be the perfect, perfect end to your summer. John, the intellectually most difficult combination, because I, I tended to think of the virtues as juggling balls, and you can't juggle all of them at once. And the two difficult ones to merge are meekness and constancy, particularly in the crucible of friendship. Because meekness, you discussed it in the, con in the context of friendship, giving way when you really don't want to give way in meekness, but constancy standing firm when you have to, particularly in this age, there are a lot of friendships that have sundered as meekness gave way to constancy in people's view on politics. Do you want to explain how those can sometimes coexist but may come into conflict? 
They can certainly be in tension with one another, and your example is a good one. I think they've really poisoned our political life. There was a time in, when members of Congress on both sides of the aisle would disagree in the course of the day and then go out and have dinner together, and we don't see that happening so much anymore. We've moved to the peripheries on, in both parties. Um, it's also a lesson that you learn uh, in, in marriage and friendship. You know, you're you're not going to agree with your friends. You're not going to agree with your spouse about everything. And sometimes you just have to um, uh, give up your own attachment to your own way of doing things. Uh, on the other hand, there are certain principles that uh, you just can't yield on. But, uh, but you can do it in a way that isn't oppressive. Uh, you know, I, I, I've told our kids as they've gone off to college uh, that People will respect you, even if you're a nerd, if you're different from everybody else. But if you own what you are and you're frank about it uh, and just say, look, this is what I believe. Um, tell me what you think. Uh, it's uh, it's an invitation to a conversation rather than an argument. Now, John Garvey, beginning with 9-11, the United States has been under two decades of extraordinary stress. And it manifests itself in political extremism like Bush lied, people died birtherism versus Obama, the division over President Trump. I don't know that that's ever going to end in our politics, given the acceleration of news and the fracturing of news. So it's a double question. Are you as pessimistic as I am? And how do you acquire your information about the news and about the world? Where do you get it from? Well, the answer to the second part of the question is, uh, in the morning, I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Those are uh, different points of view. Um, some uh, I agree with more than others, but uh, it's a way of listening to what people I disagree with have to say. Um, it's also a way of reading in a little more depth than I'd get on a, on a feed on my phone. So um, it's an opportunity to, uh, to broaden my own thinking. Will it ever end? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, it's such a complicated thing. Part of it is uh, a result of our methods of communicating. We, we, we don't filter our thoughts through editorial writers at the major newspapers. They, uh, anybody who wants can put up a blog and say whatever they want with no editorial um, oversight. Uh, and things happen I fast, so there isn't an opportunity for second thought. The meekness and gentleness virtues. Let me talk about their hidden uh, assassins, vulgarity and profanity. And, and I believe vulgarity and profanity infiltrated originally through cable. You know, the FCC controls what I can say to you right now, and that's a good thing. But as soon as we go off the air for the extended podcast, those rules don't apply, though I will continue to practice them. If you go to Twitter... I tell young people all the time, is the vulgarity necessary? Is the profanity ever necessary? Did you have rules about that at Catholic University? Actually, we didn't have any rules about what you could say or what you couldn't say. And we didn't have any rules about who could come and speak, except the rule that anybody who wanted to come and speak could come and speak. We did have rules uh, about giving honorary degrees and about uh, university endowed lectures because there the invitation comes from the university and they're representing us. So uh, when the when the university itself spoke, we had uh, yeah very direct and um, clear rules about uh, about who was going to be our commencement speaker. But uh, we wanted to encourage uh, free conversation among the kids. It was. Um, something that, that worked out pretty well. I mean, it was an antidote to the cancel culture, which we see. But I think that something about our being uh, a Catholic university, about the sort of students that we attracted, um, uh, moved people not to, uh, not to take that approach with one another. And my job as president uh, was also... Um, uh, Part of my job as president was to set an example for the students about how to have conversations. You know, I, I've had many very serious conversations about important subjects with a lot of people over a lot of years, uh, including you're probably friends with Archbishop Chaput. The ability to express very firm positions without giving unnecessary offense or vulgarity or profanity is so crucial to persuasion. Hey, American, when you want to hear the rest of this conversation with John Garvey about this book, The Virtues, it will be on today's podcast. There's not much more of it, maybe 10 or 15 minutes more, but you want to listen to it all and you want to get the book from Amazon 
you'll love it. It'll be a it'll be a joy to read, and you'll remember certain stories, and you'll hear the rest of what I have remembered and put in my outline if you tune into the podcast. Thank you all for listening. I'll be back tomorrow on the radio show. I'll continue talking to John Garvey on today's podcast, available at the Salem Podcast Network and at iTunes. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I am back now with John Garvey on the Hugh Hewitt Show podcast, highly concentrated Hugh. John, there, uh, there's a couple of things. Obviously, no book can be exhaustive, and I always hate comments on my post columns. Why didn't you write about this? It's because I got 800 words. So I wondered, I wanted to give you a chance, though, to say something about special opportunities for virtue in the single life, the life of a vocation, and in particular, the life of a Catholic school teacher who give up knowingly money and pension to serve. And I'm thinking of Ron Karenbauer and Fred Hoover and people in my life. I mean, I wouldn't be educated if Catholic schools didn't exist with professionals who made a virtue of teaching. But I also think of single people in vocations. You can't write about everything, but I know you must appreciate these three special virtues. I certainly do. Uh, let me begin with teachers because I've been one myself. In fact, um, you asked about uh, what it was like to be a university president because it seemed like a miserable job. But in fact, what drew me to being a president was it was kind of an extension of our own raising of our own children. I, uh, we view the job of the university as to form people in virtue as well as wisdom during their time there and living among the students as we did and uh, talking to them every day, having dinner and lunch with them, teaching them in class, going to their sports events. We got to know students well, and it was really a joy. Young people that age are so fun and funny and interesting, and they're so eager to, uh, to learn what you think about the problems that are most important to them. So um, there's a particular virtue that uh, draws people to, uh, to the teaching profession, but they're really rewarded by learning about the virtues of their students. Let, let me add as well, uh, I mentioned three great college presidents I've known. The greatest is Larry Arn up at Hillsdale, and I've known Larry for 30 years. I consider him my teacher, actually. He lives among the students. He goes to the cafeteria always. I'm not sure how Catholic University is laid out. I've only been on campus a couple of times. I don't know if you could actually live among the students, John. Were you able to do that? Sure. We had a, uh, our house was right on campus. I had a, I had a white card that I used in the cafeteria. So I would just go and have lunch or have dinner. My wife would do the same uh, with the students. We had, in fact, we had a, one of the ways we had of drawing students in was uh, we had a dog. Um, we now have a second dog, which we acquired just a year ago. Um, and we had a rule that students could come to the house and sign out the dog and take them for a walk. Oh. And <laughs> so it was a, saved us a lot of trouble. You know, we didn't have to walk the dog, but we also got to meet students who, uh, find you more approachable if you know if they can focus on the dog. It's like uh, it's like um, when you're a young person, if you're carrying a baby around. A baby is a great attractor for people because they don't have to make contact with you. They can just look at the baby and say, "How oh, cute." That is a great idea. And Doctor Arn has a couple of boxers. I don't know if he'll trust them to anyone else, right? He loves his boxers so much, but yeah, so, you don't want to uh, walk it. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want. You have to be careful what kind of dog you have. When we first moved in, we had a big black German Shepherd, and my favorite dog of all time, but she was scary. Uh, we then got a small utility backup dog that uh, would go off with anybody. It was just promiscuous. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of Larry Brown, who played for the Indians when we were growing up. Let me, let me go on to talk to you about humility. Barry Sanders, Abraham Lincoln, and Fanny Price do not appear in the same chapter, as you note, very often. Now, I have to confess something. I have not read a page of Jane Austen. The Fetching Mrs. Hewitt has read every page of Jane Austen. I have not read a page of Jane Austen. So I don't even know who Fanny Price is from Fanny Bryce. You know, it could have been either one for me. But, but you put those three together to try and explain humility to people. And I love Barry Sanders especially. Expand on that, uh, John Garvey. Uh, what I love about Barry Sanders is that he, uh, he had a sort of anti-touchdown dance. He said... He would behave, as Frank Leahy used to say to his boys at Notre Dame, as though he'd been there before when he got to the end zone. He'd just hand the ball to the ref. Uh, same with Abraham Lincoln. You know, Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a wonderful book, Team of Rivals, about Lincoln's relations with the, with the people in his cabinet. And they all thought they were smarter than Lincoln. And he was content to let them think that and appreciate what their virtues were. But it was uh, his humility and his own strength that 
uh, allowed them to come to trust him and to uh, to rely on him. It's a yeah, it's a virtue that I it's a virtue that I work hard at because uh, it's one that I don't do very well at. Uh, neither do I, but it's it's actually antithetical to being a radio talk show host. Frequently wrong, never in doubt. Uh, so, John Garvey, I want to finish by talking about courage and magnanimity. Uh, they're different things. Courage, people think they understand, but perhaps they don't. Magnanimity is difficult to grasp. It's greatness of soul. You talk about them both, and I I'd sort of like your comments on both of those, because we can't cover every one of the virtues. People have to read the book and think about it. And again, it's a wonderful book, but those two are worth closing about. Courage and magnanimity, would you contrast those? Sure. Um in my class on the virtues, uh, we begin early on with temperance and then with courage. The example that I use in this lecture, uh, in, in the book about courage, is my mother. Uh, not, you know, when typically we think of courage as a virtue for soldiers, uh, the willingness to risk your life, and uh, and the virtue of courage is a willingness to give up some great good for the sake of an even greater good, and um, that's a you know, I might have used uh, one of my daughters as an example. She had, uh, she's a single mom uh, and has three children, who, three daughters who live with her, and she had cancer three years ago and dealt with this in a way that was just, uh, you know, that that sort of patience and bearing up under strain without complaining is uh, is, uh, is an example of courage that ordinary people give. Same with my mom when she was losing her ability to speak. Um, uh, she took that with the kind of patience and forbearance that uh, Thomas Aquinas says is the most excellent example of of courage. The, the picture you drew of her, by the way, making her last trip to her Colorado uh, uh, refuge, reminded me, Mark Garin had just directed me to uh, uh, E.B. White's one, Once More to the Lake, and it had that yeah. golden pond element to it. Exactly right. That's uh, it was her favorite place in the world, and and she uh, there came a time when she couldn't live on her own, and the kids were all fighting over who ought to have her, but we all decided by common consent that my sister Annette, who was most like mother, had eight children like mother, and just looked like her, should be the one who got mother. So uh, mother was leaving Pennsylvania to go out to Colorado, um, and leaving the place that was her favorite place in the world to be. My brother Dennis. Uh, took her out to take uh, uh, one last walk around the cottage. And when she was done, she just like squared her shoulders as she would do and got in the car and never said another word about it. But you know, it would have broken that my That is heart. courage. Yeah. Now, magnanimity, that's greatness of soul. And it's not necessarily very modest, is it? No, it isn't very modest. In fact, uh, it's a virtue that Aristotle puts at near the top of the heap, uh, the, the ability to uh, to take care of your friends, to do good things for other people. But the greatness of soul is, um, in some ways, the opposite of Christian humility, isn't it? Humility was a kind of vice, according to Aristotle. Nevertheless, magnanimity is something you're in a position to do when you get older, to uh, to take care of people um, because you're not concerned with supporting yourself. And uh, and uh, it's, it's also a virtue that we would love to see in... Our politicians, you know, I mean, I think of George Washington as a great example of magnanimity, somebody who just gave his life for his country uh, and uh, put away things that he cared most about, like taking care of his farm in order to lead the, lead the soldiers through the revolution, to lead the country through the first two terms. I gave a lecture on Washington at Hillsdale once, and Dr. Arn told me the word I was looking for was rectitude. Uh, uh, rectitudinousness, and perhaps it might be magnanimity. I want to close with a quote. My favorite quote is a Montaigne quote. Constant cheerfulness is the surest sign of wisdom. But I'm going to add to it one that I didn't know, and I had to look up and think about. Glory be to God for dappled things. I had never read that before. I went and found Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem. I've thought about it. Uh, we got Steelers fans who are listening to this, uh, uh, Dr. Garvey. What do you mean by uh, what did he mean by glory be to God for dappled things? Uh, Hopkins was a Jesuit and a and a poet, a very influential poet, in fact. He's, he was big on uh, alliteration and uh, and so on. But, uh, um, but uh, he just appreciated the beauty of the world around him, you know, seeing God in, uh, in small animals or trees, uh, uh, water reflecting off the underside of 
trees on the lake or uh, beautiful sunsets or, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to love the world around us. This is the sort of thing that motivates the, the young people's attachment to uh, taking care of the environment. You know, eco um, ecology and love for the world, um, Pope Francis says, is uh, one of the new works of corporal works of mercy. It's something that we ought to pay attention to because we love it. We love what God has given us. Well, glory be to, that, to God for dappled things and for wonderful books. The virtue is in the latter category. I don't think it has many dapples. But John Garvey, I hope our paths meet physically at some point in the Beltway when you're back on a sojourn to, your, uh, to the university you led so well for 13 years. Thank you for joining me this morning, and congratulations on the virtues. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thanks for having me. Be well.